Hello, Stuart from Magenic again. This time we're going to talk about security. In fact, we're going to talk about Stride and the Microsoft Threat Modeling Tool. This is a very useful tool to help model systems and understand their interactions. And the tool's analytical functions help you figure out potential threat vectors. So some key URLs. Uh, you can go to the Microsoft uh, SDL site and go to their threat modeling tool and there's a download link at the bottom of the page. You can read about the Microsoft Software Development Lifecycle, which is excellent guidance about the fact security like pixie dust is not something you sprinkle on at the end. It starts long before you incept your project and continues on long after your project is in production. I wanted to start by running through the STRIDE model, what that acronym stands for, and uh, talk a little bit about the tool. And then we're going to see the tool in action and its report, and we'll wrap up with a few thoughts. So there are a number of threat vector models. DREAD was very popular for a while. There are any other number of models, but Stride uh, turns out to be extremely relevant in the modern distributed ecosystems like the cloud. It's my personal favorite because I think that each of the vector areas are, are easy for both technical and business owners to understand, which is not to say that remediating these threats is in any way easy can be very difficult, but the six basic concepts that are enveloped in the STRIDE model are pretty clear and easy to understand. And STRIDE's an easy acronym to remember. Spoofing of user identity, that is to say, pretending that you are who you are not in order to gain access to a system. Tampering is about manipulating the system to change data in undesirable ways. So tampering can take many forms and many vectors. It can be on the wire. It can be exploiting a security gap in a form that allows you to change data. It can be unprotected APIs, all sorts of things, right? Owning a server and getting access to its data and so on. Repudiation is a vector that is about inability of a system owner to, with any clarity, identify who did what in a system. So we say that it's a repudiation attack because we're able to repudiate or deny that we were the agent responsible for doing something. It could even be a good thing. So we want repudiation protection Information disclosure, these are the ones you read about most on the internet. When you read about XYZ Corp having a security incident and inadvertently 2 million credit cards or usernames and passwords or social security numbers were leaked. Information disclosure, while it is one of the most newsworthy because it's frankly the easiest for readers to understand generally comes as the result of one of these other threat vectors. Denial of service, that is to tie up resources in such a way they can't be used for their intended purpose. And these days, the most common denial of service attack is a distributed denial of service attack or DDoS attack. But the goal is the same, to disrupt the orderly use of the computing resources that we're trying to protect. Lastly, elevation of privilege. You're a regular user and somehow you gain administrative or some other elevated privilege and you're able to do things that you shouldn't be able to do. So very simple threat vector model, easy to understand, although repudiation is a little inobvious, but you can think of repudiation as audit the auditability of a system and the indelibility and tamper resistance of those logs. And that goes along with confidence in user identity. That is to say, when we look at the audit trail, that we're confident if it says Bob did this on this time and day, that it was Bob, right? So these things all are related together, right? They all interact. Two or three of these can be used to 
disrupt the system behavior or gain access to things you shouldn't, and that can result in information disclosure. And of course, the consequences of all of these things are a loss of reputation. There can be a financial impact. There can be an operational impact and so on. So we want to protect ourselves by doing the sort of analysis at the start of a project. And every time we make a significant architectural or topological network type change in rerunning this analysis and keeping these models up to date. And this is a static process, but it's not the end of the process, right? Security tools, uh, that look at code, security tools that look at networks and so on are all part of the ecosystem. But today, we're just going to talk about the threat modeling tool itself. This is the security engineering uh, site from Microsoft. And we've gone to the threat modeling page. And the link is provided earlier in the documentation. You can see that they have a threat modeling set of steps and we're going to be showing you the diagram and identification steps and obviously mitigate and validate are done via making corrections to our network topology our code and so on and then validate is by using um, active security testing tools so uh, code scanning tools tools that scan our networks for vulnerabilities, uh, tools that try to do penetration testing, and so on. And then that leads us to redefine our problem space after we make our mitigations and we validate that they worked, we're gonna redefine the problem. And this cycle should be continuous throughout the lifetime of an application. This is not a one and done type process. It's something that you need to do. And so if you go to the bottom of the page, uh, you're going to be able to load this, download this tool. And we've done that, and we've done the diagramming, and we're going to show you that next. Here is the threat modeling tool. And if you used any kind of drawing tool, Draw.io, Visio, Shapeworks, whatever, you're going to find this interface very familiar. Uh, it's a piece of graph paper. And we're going to drag objects onto that piece of graph paper in terms of security participants and uh, boundaries and so on. And for each one of them, as we drag them on, we're going to be setting their properties. Some of the properties are already set and some of them are not. And, and then we're going to drag uh, lines on which uh, talk about the interaction between something like a user and uh, this website. And you can see we've identified those things as being HTTPS. And you can see that we've defined that there's a web application firewall in between the cold, cruel world and our application system, which in this case, I've modeled to be on Google just to show you this tool kind of works for any scenario on any platform. And you can see we have two major interactors. We have external automation through our API and we have user interaction via browser to our website. The website uses a configuration server. It uses Redis. Both of the things in the DMZ that face forward uh, use the internal API. You'll notice we have HTTPS throughout with the exception of some interactions via Redis. And then our fake API um, allows us to talk to our, our bucket storage engine on the Google Cloud platform. And then we have a VPN tunnel that goes back to our SQL server or NFS and an arbitrary web server. Each of the red dotted lines our dashed lines represents a security boundary and we name the security boundaries and set their properties and as lines uh, either connect to shapes or cross security boundaries the tool is able to 
use all of those properties and understand that because we've crossed the security boundary that certain things are true based on the boundary type. And based on that, it can make recommendations. Here is a, an N-tier app uh, with external interactors and with things in our data center. And then uh, just for fun, uh, the applications that are deployed into Google are running in Pivotal Cloud Foundry. And um, we're using Google Bucket's storage platform as a service. So this is... Uh, reasonably but not horrifically overcomplicated demo and so we can look at these look at and visualize the interactions and when I'm going to make a high level or level zero kind of architecture document uh, or drawing I find that if I start with this tool even though it's a little square wheelie it's a little clunky it's not as smooth as Drio or Visio but it's not bad that not only do I start thinking about security and about security boundaries and and process boundaries and interactions right out of the bat, but this is a nice way of diagramming the high level. How does the system work? What are the deployable units? Who are the actors or interactors? What kind of protocols are in use and so on and so forth? So I find that if I have to make a, a high level diagram for an architecture review board uh, or to educate my development and testing teams about what the major system interactions are and uh, who's who in the zoo, who talks to what and so on, that if I start in this tool, I get kind of a two for one thing. I get a way of diagramming my system, but the analytics built into this tool also then inform me about security concerns uh, using the language and vocabulary of Stride. So in order to get that, what I do is I go ahead and open the reports and I say create a report. And I'm going to generate a report and I'm going to put it into a uh, f a file in a folder. Uh, these are written in HTML. They come up in the browser and you can see that it's got nice pictures of my diagram. And then for each set of interactions, that is to say, for each of the shapes that is crossed, it has a selection of things. And it tells you about the things that you ought to care about or at least consider. And as you do that, you can go back into the diagram and say, okay, well, this is handled, so I don't need to worry about it. And you should put in a note in as to why it's handled. And you do that for each of the interactions. And you can see it takes a little snapshot of the interaction and how it talks. And this provides a punch list of things that you need to care about or at least consider uh, as you're modeling your application. So this is very useful as a tool. It tends to give you more things than you care about. Sometimes certain threats are sort of globally mitigated by the infrastructure, but if they are, then you should uh, go through all the places it throws them out, check the it's okay box, the out of scope box, put in an explanation as to why, and the next time you run the report, you'll have fewer things to care about. And every time you make a significant change to your diagram, uh, you should rerun the report and go through it, um, ideally with security professionals in your organization, InfoSec and so on. And just make sure that you are doing everything that is reasonable to do to protect your application system. Some takeaway points. Use the SDL tool to identify from your topology, in other words, your deployable units and how they interact, what your likely security concerns are. Again, they're always gonna be related to Stride. And this is not a one and done process. You should do this with every significant change. And this is not the only tool you're gonna need. You're gonna need and want to use static code analyzers, including things that scan your packages and libraries for known vulnerabilities because it's hard to build software without some third-party components. You're going to want to invest in security testing tools that test 
not only your code, but your infrastructure as well. A lot of those are active monitoring tools that run on your network all the time and are looking for problematic interactions and behaviors. You're going to want to have a security peer review. So an architecture review board, a security review, whatever you want to call it, where well-versed developers, QAs, BAs, and security professionals walk through the system, look at the reports produced not only by the threat modeling tool, but by all the tooling, and then we're going to want to leverage uh, penetration testing tools. And for most companies, because of separation of duties concerns, so a lot of the time, although they have uh, penetration testing tools that they run in advance, they also leverage a third-party testing service to validate that they've done everything that they need to do and they've identified all the threats. Parenthetically, sometimes it's not cost effective to mitigate all the threats, but if you're going to be a responsible code owner, you should at least identify them. And then you make business decisions that say, well, it would cost us X amount of dollars to fix this if it, indeed it can be fixed. And what's the consequence if uh, it's not fixed? What's the likelihood that will happen? And, and do a considered risk analysis and decide what the right smart thing is to do and to keep track of these security concerns in the application backlog along with your other stories and non-functional requirements. Security is not pixie dust. You can't sprinkle it on at the end and be successful. Thank you very much for your kind attention. My name is Stuart Williams.